What's the right way for us to end our prayers? We've been talking for the last seven weeks about all the things that we should say in the middle of our prayer, but now it's time for us to land the plane and ask what is the right way for us to end our prayers? What's the finish of our prayers? According to the Lord's Prayer, which we just prayed, the end of prayer is God's glory. And so as we conclude our series on the Lord's Prayer, we're going to be focusing in on that. God's glory as the finish of prayer. Some of you might be wondering uh, why we're going to be looking at an Old Testament text if we're finishing up the Lord's Prayer, which happens in the New Testament. And here's the reason why I've decided to preach from an Old Testament text. If you are turning in your Bibles or following along, you can turn to 1 Chronicles 16. So here's the reason why we're going to be looking at 1 Chronicles uh, instead of Matthew. In the best of our New Testament Greek manuscripts, the Lord's Prayer actually ends with the verse that we studied last week. Jesus doesn't actually give us a conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. And without going into too much detail about this, our English Bibles uh, are translated from a variety of Greek manuscripts. You, you might have studied this in the past or heard this uh, in, in your own life. So, so what you hold in your hands is what we think the original copy or the original manuscript said, and we base that on a reliable historical text witness. And so if we look at those reliable and historical textual witnesses, the earliest and the best of them, the most comprehensive of them, don't look like the prayer that we just prayed at that last concluding note. There is no conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. Jesus moves on to talk about prayer and forgiveness at that point. If you look at your Bibles, most of them will have a footnote on that particular section saying something like, some manuscript add, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So what's a preacher to do? Well, I can't preach on a footnote, right? Every sermon needs to be based on something that we think was actually written in that original manuscript, the actual word of God given to his church. But there is something that is clearly wonderful about that traditional conclusion that we just prayed. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, John Calvin says that even though this phrase is not in the original manuscripts, it is so appropriate a conclusion that we shouldn't omit it. N.T. Wright says that it's inconceivable that Jesus would have ended his model prayer without a conclusion like that in mind. R.C. Sproul says that this is one of the most important portions of the Lord's Prayer, if not the most important. J.I. Packer says that even though it's not in the best manuscripts, it's in the best tradition. And so if we follow these great minds and spiritual leaders in the church, there is clearly some merit for us praying this prayer, taking that, those words of glory on our lips every week and incorporating it into our daily prayers. And here's, here's the benefit of doing that. It focuses our attention on God's glory, and that is the best place for us to end our prayers. King David demonstrates that in today's text. As we'll see in 1 Chronicles 16, God's glory is the focus of this amazing magisterial prayer. Through it, through this wonderful God-glory-focused prayer, we learn something that will change our lives. God transforms our lives as we make his glory the end of prayer. God transforms our lives as we make his glory the end of prayer. And so with that in mind, let's focus our attention now on God's word. Again, I'll be reading from 1 Chronicles, beginning in verse 8. I'll be reading through verse 36 and just... Pay attention because there's a place that will allow a, a responsive reading in the last verse uh, with you all saying the word amen. And, and I, I pray that you embrace that uh, with, with whole hearts. This is God's word. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. 
Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered, O offspring of Israel, his servants, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed as a statute to Jacob, as an everlasting covenant to Israel, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. When you were few in number and of little account and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, From one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and he is to be held in awe above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the earth, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Say also, save us, O God of our salvation, and gather and deliver us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Brothers and sisters, thus far in the reading of God's word, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Lord, what a wonderful word you have given to us this morning. It is a privilege to sit and ponder your glory. And and even though these words are clear, we still need your help. We need your help to really understand your glory and really have it press into our hearts so that it will change our lives. And so we beg you now, through your spirit, would you attend your word? Would you work through your word so that we would glorify you and bring you honor and so that as we encounter you in your glory and majesty, we would be filled with joy so that we can truly enjoy you as our chief end. We pray that you would do all of this to your glory and for our great good. Do this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to be asking three questions about prayer and God's glory. And here's the first question for us this morning. What is the proper end of prayer? 
What is the proper end of prayer? The traditional ending to the Lord's Prayer shows us that healthy prayer is committed to God's glory. When we pray, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, we're praising God for his immense power and glory. We're calling to mind and dedicating all of our prayers to this wonderful God, and we're acknowledging that all of our desires are ultimately submitted to him. The end of all our prayer is about his kingdom, his power, his glory. Healthy prayer is ultimately about God's glory. What is the proper end of prayer? God's glory is the proper end of prayer. That word end can be used in two different ways. End can mean purpose, like the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is our purpose. That is our destiny and aim in life. End can mean purpose. End can also mean conclusion, like the end of a book or the end of a journey. And when I say that God's glory is the end of prayer, I mean it in both of those senses, both purpose and conclusion. The proper purpose of prayer is God's glory. The reason that we pray is to glorify God. Prayer is an act of worship. We see that in the text. If we were to zoom out a little bit from the, the passage that we just read to see the, the verses before it and the verses after it, we see that this prayer is happening in the midst of an extended, elaborate worship service. The people are praising God. And the crowning moment of this magisterial worship service is this wonderful prayer. The purpose of prayer is to worship God. We pray in order to worship. Many people, when they're just learning to pray, sometimes find prayer to be kind of tedious, maybe a little bit boring and awkward. They're not sure what to say when they talk to God in prayer. But once you learn that the purpose of prayer is God's glory, it opens up all sorts of new subjects for you to fill your prayers with. We can praise God for his character. We can praise God for his strength, for his beauty and excellence. We can praise God for his salvation, just like we see throughout this entire text. Verse 8, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Or verse 12, remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles, the judgments that he has uttered. Verse 14, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Verse 23, sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Or verse 27, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. This prayer glorifies God in all kinds of ways. There's all kinds of things we can pray in Pray to God in our prayers if prayer is for the purpose of glorifying God. One of my college mentors was a PCA ruling elder, and hearing him pray was a master class in glorifying God through prayer. His prayers were riddled with praise. Throughout the prayer, he would invoke God's electing love, God's covenantal faithfulness, Christ's redemption, the Spirit's power and intimacy and presence. Th throughout all of the prayer, he would speak wonderful things about God. And when he prayed, you learned that prayer was far more than just making requests to God. Prayer is worship. And so if you need a starting place for this, if you're just learning how to talk to your heavenly Father, just look to the Lord's Prayer and it'll equip you for ways that you can praise God. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the reign. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever. Those are great ways to add worship to your prayer. The purpose of prayer is God's glory. Also, the proper conclusion to prayer is God's glory. Listen to that closing verse, the very end of this prayer. Just after they pray a very important petition 
on behalf of the Lord to save them from the nations, give them deliverance, and bring them to their own place so, they could, so that they could give God glory. After this incredibly important request, here's how the prayer ends. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Praise is the best conclusion to prayer. And the Lord's Prayer teaches that too. After praying all of these grand and amazing requests for God's name and God's kingdom and God's will to be manifested everywhere, for God to meet all of our physical and spiritual needs, it comes all back around and ends with God's glory. Praise is the best way to end our prayer because it brings our attention back to the main thing. Let's be honest, it is easy for us to get distracted in prayer. In the midst of a busy life, it is easy to make prayer a frantic list of things that we want or need with little attention to worship, with little time spent adoring God. And so if you've ever hit a rut in your prayer life, where your prayer does not feel like a real connection with God anymore, try looking at the conclusion of your prayer. And maybe that can help. How do you conclude your prayers? Well, most of us end with the phrase, in Jesus' name, amen. Why do we say that? It's more than just a textbook finish. It's not just the prayer 101, here's how to end your prayer. It's actually a launch pad for worship. In Jesus' name, amen, this is a stunning recognition of our own inadequacy, our own unworthiness, and of God's salvation and love. It says that we cannot come to the Father on our own. That when we present our prayers to God, we cannot pray in our own name, hoping that our credentials will grant us access into his presence so that he'll hear our prayers. No, we need a mediator, and we have one. Because of Jesus, we can actually come into the presence of God. We can commune with God. We can enjoy him. We can ask him everything that we need. We can tell him all about our problems. We can draw near to the Lord and confess our sins, confess our pains and frustrations and disappointments and worries and fears. In Jesus' name says that God loves us that God wants us to be in his presence, that God wants us to come near to him. And so he was willing to save us. He was willing to open the pathway to his presence through Christ. And so how do you conclude your prayer? Is it just with a simple rote, in Jesus' name, amen, so that the prayer can conclude and you can start your meal? And if so, add some worship to your conclusion and your prayer with praise by thinking about that phrase in Jesus' name, amen. We thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. We thank you for your power and your provision. We thank you for loving us in spite of our weaknesses. And so, in Jesus' name, not in our own name, O Lord, for we are unworthy, but in Jesus' name, in the name of our Savior and Keeper, the one who died for our sins and was raised for our justification, we ask all of these things, amen. And amen just simply means yes, or may it be so. God's glory is the end of prayer. It's the reason we pray, and it's the best way to finish a prayer. And this is true no matter how you feel. It might feel easy to pray some of these laudatory prayers, some of these prayers that are just exulting in God's glory when you feel great. It might feel a little bit harder to do that when you feel lousy. How can we pray for God's glory when we feel lousy? Well, First Chronicles is actually a great help for us. It's a model for how we should pray when we are desperate for help. When David originally wrote this prayer for the people, it was during a time of great celebration. But in the book of Chronicles, it's used during a time of great need. As you read through First and Second Chronicles, you learn that this particular history was written for God's 
people in a great time of need. The people had come back from the Babylonian exile. They had endured 70 years of traumatic upheaval. They were still an oppressed people, and they needed to remember who they were. They were God's people. They had God's promises. And so how then should they pray? with an extreme focus on God's glory, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. In their moment of need, God's glory was the focus. No matter how you feel, make God's glory the focus of your prayer. And that leads us to the second question. How does God's glory transform our prayer? How does God's glory transform our prayer? What does it do when we make God's glory the purpose and conclusion of our prayer? Well, it does four things. Here are the four things. It makes us humble. It makes us happy. It makes us hopeful, and it makes us hunger for holiness. Humble, happy, hopeful, and hunger for holiness. When we make God's glory the end of our prayer, again, end being the purpose and conclusion of our prayer, it makes us humble. As soon as we see how great and amazing God is, we see how small and insignificant we are. And so we are led to pray like we hear in verse 30, tremble before him all the earth. Compared to his power, our achievements are minuscule. What could we bring to the table to impress this great God? Could we bring our flimsy works of righteousness or our flimsy efforts at perfection or power? No, when we, are, when we focus on God, we're humbled. He brings us to a, a, a right understanding of exactly who we are. But don't misunderstand me. This humbling is not dehumanizing. It is not undignified to be humbled before God because when we are properly humble, we can actually enjoy God's saving mercy. And so when we make God's glory the end of our prayer, it makes us happy. Listen to how joyous this hymn is. Even just talking about creation, let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is a joyful, happy prayer for the people to pray. It does wonderful things for your mood when you focus on God's glory. It's like going to an amazing fireworks show when you are in a bad mood. It's pretty hard to stay in a bad mood when you witness something as grand and glorious as a fireworks show. Just think about it, sitting there, a dark sky, and then all of a sudden these amazing bursts of light and color and sound and beauty and grandness wash over you. You begin to Forget about how you feel, the slights that maybe happened to you before you showed up there. You get lost in the moment. And it's like that with God's glory. Allow yourself to get caught up in God's majesty and beauty and splendor. Counterintuitively, counterintuitively, when we are humble, we become more happy. When we make prayer less about us and more about God, we end up being tremendously blessed. It makes us happy. It also makes us hopeful. Part of God's glory is his redeeming love. And when you realize this, when you realize how glorious God is and that he is here to save you, your entire outlook on life changes. Think about it. It would be absolutely terrifying if a God this powerful were out to get you. I think of that scene in the movie Aladdin 
where Jafar becomes this amazingly powerful evil genie, it would be terrifying to stand in in someone's presence who is that powerful, but who is out to do you harm. But David is saying, look upon this God of majesty and magnificence and rejoice. Rejoice, because our God comes to save us. This entire hymn rings out with God's covenantal saving love from the promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to the covenantal name of the Lord, which is revealed in the Exodus, even to the hope that God will rescue the people from the nations, something that these people that were listening to 1 and 2 Chronicles desperately wanted. God's glory holds the promise of redemption. Consider verse 11, seek his presence continually. Well, that word for presence in the Hebrew could also be translated face. And many translations actually translate that particular verse, seek his face continually. But remember what God told Moses in Exodus 33. God said, I will make All my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, but you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. But here, through David, God says to his church, seek my face, seek my presence. It's the promise of redemption. God will cleanse us from our sins. He will restore us to his presence. That's the beautiful picture at the end of the book, right? And the end of the the book of Revelation, the new heavens and the new earth, we will see his face. It's a glorious future that we can look forward to. And God has already begun that work of redemption now through Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, verse 6, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Through Christ, we can behold God's glory now. Redemption is already happening now. Focusing on God's glory gives us hope. And finally, it makes us hungry for holiness. It makes us hungry for holiness. When we are consumed with God's glory, we become more and more interested in seeing God's glory go forth in our lives and in the world. This prayer that we hear is surprisingly missional. Listen to verse 24, declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. Or verse 31 again, let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. It's a cry for the salvation of the world. Our focus on God's glory becomes in us a desire to see the entire world glorify God. We want to see God's glory spread, and we have a part to play in it. How exactly would the surrounding nations know that God was glorious? It's because they would witness God's glory through the redeemed lives of God's people. John Calvin puts it this way, The Holy Spirit has consecrated us as temples of God. We, therefore, must let the glory of God shine through us. We must let the glory of God shine through us. Now, how can we do that? Here's Calvin's answer. In our lives, we should mirror Christ. You want to let the glory of God shine through you, then in your own life, mirror Christ. Jesus, he was hungry for holiness. And in that hunger for holiness, he resisted sin. He denounced injustice. He comforted the brokenhearted. And when we become hungry for holiness, we will do the same thing. When we focus on God's glory, we become like Christ. 
God's glory will shine through us for the unbelieving world to see, and then we can tell of his salvation from day to day. We can declare his glory among the nations. So how does God's glory transform prayer? Well, it completely revolutionizes your prayer life. No longer is prayer some some quasi-mystical thing that only super-spiritual Christians do, or some burdensome task of spending time with someone that you barely know and having to make awkward conversation. No, prayer becomes an actual encounter with God that changes your life. You become humble, happy, hopeful, hungry for holiness. Doesn't that sound like the kind of person that you want to be? In our world, we're constantly looking for life hacks. We're always on the, on the search for that one thing that's going to make life more effective. And if you were to ask me, what is the one thing I could do to grow in my relationship with God? How can I grow in my faith? Just give me one thing. I would say, make your prayers focused on God's glory from start to finish. And again, the Lord's Prayer helps. Here are three words that can get you started, that can kickstart your journey of making your prayer all about God's glory, kingdom, power, glory. I really think that a dedicated focus on God's glory will change your life. Now, it's one thing for us to talk about God's glory. As Presbyterians, we do that a lot already, right? But it's another thing to actually experience God's glory. I'm convinced that one of the main reasons that we fall into sin or that we struggle with pride or insecurity or we struggle with kind of a lukewarm faith, it's because we do not regularly experience the glory of God in our prayer lives. And so this leads to our final question. Here's the final question. How can we experience God's glory in prayer? How can we experience God's glory in prayer? To borrow a line from Tim Keller, we've got to do some head work and some heart work. Here's the head work. We need to fill our minds with the truth of God's glory. Fill our minds with the truth of God's glory. So this week, take a stack of note cards or a notebook, or a piece of paper, or open up a a new thing on your phone, or on your computer, a, a Word document, and start a list of scriptures answering this question, why is God glorious? Just answer that. Go through the scriptures and search, why is God glorious? And if you need a good starting point, 1 Chronicles 16 is an amazing resource. You could probably spend all week long on this one passage, just cataloging all of the different ways that this prayer talks about God's glory. Why is God glorious according to 1 Chronicles 16? Well, just just look at him. Look at his attributes, his strength his power, his love, his moral purity and holiness, his goodness, his beauty and splendor radiating forth. Look at his faithfulness. Look at his trustworthiness. Look at his desire to save you, his desire for you to come into into his presence. That's why God is glorious. God is glorious in creation. Verse 26, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens... So just go outside on a nice day and look up in the cloudless sky and bask in the warmth of the sun and just take it all in. Or go out on, on some clear night and look into the heavens and behold all of the stars just looking down at you. God made all of that. Creation sings his glory. And God is glorious in redemption. Again, through the power of the crucified and risen Jesus Christ, we can now seek out the face of God. We can draw near to God. And even more than that, he has drawn near to us in the most personal and intimate way. He has given us the spirit of Christ. Every single one of us can enjoy God's presence every day. First Chronicles shows us all of those various things, how God is glorious. 
And if you want to do more than that, if you want to go on from there, you can write out scriptures related to the ending of the Lord's Prayer. What about God's kingdom is glorious? Why is he glorious in his power? Exactly why is God glorious? And however you decide to do it this week, do this. This is the head work. Fill your mind with the truth about God's glory. But knowing it just isn't enough. Having a stack of note cards is great, but unless it works its way down into your heart, it's not going to fully transform you. If you only do the head work, it's kind of like going out on a hike on some blisteringly hot day and understanding the fact that in your backpack you have a bottle of cool water. But that understanding alone is not going to actually quench your thirst. It's not until you pause and bring out that bottle of water and taste the first few sips of that cool, refreshing, life-giving beverage until you take several mouthfuls in and you finally can sigh. Ah, that's when you're satisfied, right? And it's like that with God. This is the heart work that we're seeking to do. We're seeking to allow our hearts to rest in the truths that we have filled our minds with. It's allowing our heart to take joy and strength in the things that intellectually we confess and know. And here's how you can do that. Here's, how, here's one of the ways that you can do that heart work this week. After you do the head work, after you've filled your mind with the truth of God's glory, then find some quiet place to sit, take a deep breath, Relax a little bit, close your eyes, and prayerfully meditate on God's glory. Bring to mind the truths of God's glory and mull them over. Kind of chew on them, think about them one by one, and then apply all of those things to your life in your heart. Apply them to all of your particular needs. And so here's an example. If you, for some reason, are dissatisfied in life, if you're feeling restless and, and anxious and just a little bit empty, you can focus on how God's glory is an incredibly satisfying thing, how God's glory is meant to fill you up. And so, so you can sit there and think God is beautiful, he is radiant in his beauty, and he wants me to enjoy that beauty. He intends for me to sit in his presence and be filled with his glory. He wants me to be fully satisfied in him. And so he sent Jesus to reclaim me, to restore me, so that I could fully enjoy him. This is true. God loves me so much. In him I have all that I need. Do that. That's a way to, to put your head work into your heart work and let your emotions bear the weight of the truths that you confess. Or if you're feeling afraid, you can focus on God's glory and his power and might. You can say, God is so majestically strong. He is so powerful. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. He protects me. He defends me. This is true in spite of what my life feels like. In spite of my circumstances, I am safe. God, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who made the heavens is my father. He is my guardian and protector. He will not let harm come to me. So again, that's another way that you can, another example of doing the heart work to allow these scriptures, to allow God's glory to change your life. And keep doing this. Keep at it. Keep doing it over and over again until your emotions are pulled toward God by these truths. You can think of it like, like a, a, a locomotive train. The truths are the engine, and they are pulling the freight of your emotions toward God. Now, this hard work takes practice, and I won't guarantee that you are immediately or always going to have some sort of amazing, powerful experience. But as you rest in these truths, God will meet you in prayer. He will give you strength. He will give you joy. You will experience his glory. So make God's glory the end of your prayer. Fill your praises 
Fulfill your prayers with praises to our king and conclude your prayer with worship. Your prayers will be transformed. Your life will be transformed. You will become more humble and happy and hopeful and hungry for holiness. You'll be in the company of the saints throughout the ages who have ended their prayers in resounding praise. And you'll join the whole host of heaven who currently surround the throne of God and the Lamb who are constantly praying blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. You will experience the presence of our glorious God to whom is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And let's all now say together as God's people, amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, glorious Father, glorious in salvation, glorious Lord Christ, the king of the world, sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning over us, and glorious spirit, the spirit of the resurrection and of power and of intimacy and intercession. Our triune God, we praise you. What a privilege it is to know your glory. Be glorified in our prayers this week. Be glorified in our lives. Let your glory shine through us, and I beg you, let us us experience your glory and majesty. We are hungry. We are thirsty. So often in life, we're like the person who is withering on that long hike, just aching for a drink of cold water. Lord, would you be with us? Would you refresh us as we seek your faith? Please reveal yourself to us through your spirit and through the work of Christ. We have confidence to pray these things in his most holy and precious name. Amen.